Right. All right. So hello, everyone. For those of you who have never heard me or seen my face before, my name is Jackie. I am the Adult Services Librarian at Northern Onondaga Public Library in North Syracuse, New York. And tonight, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Hilary Hallett from Columbia University to talk about one of my personal idols, Eleanor Glynn. Um, so Hillary, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, Jacqueline. I'm really delighted to be here. Of course. And could you just introduce yourself, please? Sure. Um, I am uh, a professor of history at Columbia University, like you said, and my research and teaching areas of specialty are women and gender um, and popular culture and you know more broadly you know the kind of contours of cultural history in the united states in a kind of transatlantic perspective uh, uh this is my second book my first book was called go west young woman the rise of early hollywood and that was how i discovered uh the subject of my second book eleanor glenn um <laughs> there she is with her cat yes uh, i did not realize it was a cat fun fact i thought it was just like a first soul and then one day i was like that's the cat <laughs> several people have told me it took them a, a few looks before they recognized that too yeah um that was one of the reasons that's a colorized photo and yes. it, it 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 it's a little it, in black and white it was even less clear oh. so that was one of the reasons i was glad they colorized it because it's a little clearer it's a cat um, yes, but in any case, so my first book was about uh, sort of the decade in which the American movie industry really became this thing called Hollywood um, and the sort of sexual politics involved in that process. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I discovered Eleanor uh, when I was writing that book and was intrigued by her because, uh, well, first of all, she was the oldest person literally working in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, and a woman to boot, which, you know, was just so unusual. Um, you know, and this was, of course, in this landscape where women did have a lot more influence, uh, not just in front of, but behind the camera mm -hmm. than we many people know. Mm -hmm. um, but still, she really stood out um, for her power, her influence, her age. And then, you know, as I started to do a little research on her, um, you know, it was really clear to me that sort of her publicity wasn't exaggerating, you know, her kind of the influence she brought with her to Los mm -hmm. Angeles in 1920 when she moved there. Mm -hmm. So um, in any case, that was, you know, sort of she ran away with a chapter of my first book. Um, and then later, many years later, I went to England one summer to see if I could find you know, the, the right materials to try to write the book kind of biography I wanted. Um, and so that's what led to my second book. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I guess that's a, by way of an introduction, sort of explaining how I got here with you. No, thank you. And for those curious, the title of the book is Inventing the It Girl, How Eleanor Glynn Created the Modern Romance and Conquered Early Hollywood. And I came across the book thanks to an Atlantic article that published in September of 2022, so September of last year, and it was The Case for the Bodice Ripper. And I'm a romance nerd. I was doing research for the romance podcast, Raging Romantics, which the library runs, and I read the article, and I was just instantly hooked by Eleanor's story. And I thought it was a little bit of a travesty that I, as a huge self-proclaimed romance nerd, had never heard her story before mm -hmm. because as you say in your book and the article and pretty much every other resource has talked about she was kind of one of the early uh trumpeters of the modern romance or modern sex novel i guess you could say or, or as it's called actually mm -hmm. um so what really enamored you of her when you first came across her with your first book um well so uh, you know she I, you know it was quite clear I, so gloria i came to eleanor glenn through gloria swanson do you know who gloria swanson yes. is right many people yeah. do right yeah so um partially because of sunset boulevard yeah. right um which is of course about the silent era of the 1920s um when hollywood was born and in any case so i was working on swanson and swanson made it really clear that this woman named eleanor glenn was her mentor and really shaped her into becoming the first mm 
glamour queen, mm -hmm. right? And remember that Swanson would have been, again, 21 when she met Eleanor Glenn. And she was from a very, you know, modest working class background, didn't graduate from high school, of course, like most of the early movie folks didn't, you know, started working in the movie industry in Chicago, where she was from when she was in her teens, mm -hmm. right, followed mm -hmm. it to Los Angeles. So my point is that, you know, Eleanor, and she made it clear that this was the woman that taught her how to walk and dress and talk and yeah. deal with the press yes. like a movie star. Yeah. Even though like Eleanor Glenn arrived in Los Angeles in 1920, having only seen literally a few movies in her life, she knew mm -hmm. almost nothing about it. And so, so then, you know, Swanson and then all these early fame, more famous personalities, you know, Samuel Goldwyn, Jesse Lasky, who was the leading um, producer at what became Paramount Pictures, mm -hmm. Rudolph Valentino, all these people that I'd heard of kept talking about her and mm -hmm. how influential she was. And then she shows up in the press as I'm doing research about other things. She's always commenting on this or that. So I was just like, who is this lady? And, you know, it was quite clear that this book called Three Weeks had, you know, that was why she was brought to Los Angeles. That book had made her into this international celebrity. So I read Three Weeks to try to figure mm -hmm. out what the fuss was about all this book and was really quite astounded. And I remember telling who was my then mentor at the time, you know, um, a women's historian named Alice Kessler Harris, you know, about this book and, you know, when I gave her a brief description of the plot and she was just like, and what year was this published? And I was like, 1907. Yeah. And she was like, wow. <laughs> it really is modern for Britain in 1907. It feels like something that would come out in literary fiction today. Yeah, it's very modern. And, you know, this is why I credit her with really inventing the modern romance novel reorienting it towards the importance that sexual chemistry plays mm -hmm. you know in a successful rela relationship reoriented towards the idea that women have sexual desire right which wasn't something that the victorians had talked about at all mm -hmm. and so you know in their literature it was heavily heavily censored and so you know as you say like people haven't heard of her. And one of the reasons people should have heard of her is that she really should be credited with really, you know, as many did at the time, you mm -hmm. know, credited her with breaking down a lot of the remaining complete um, moral hypocrisy of Victorian morality about mm -hmm. women. Yeah, something we came to the conclusion of in the podcast, which she said the quiet part out loud. With right. I love that. And sexuality and women, mm -hmm. women's desires, all that. She part of the reason that we kind of ended up coming to that she was maybe so reviled by her peers was that she talked about things that while, yes, everybody was participating in, in extramarital affairs and all that sort of stuff, she actually talked about it and she wrote about it and she based a lot of her work off of her life and experiences and those around her, too. Absolutely. And I love that. That is um, very, very well put about saying the quiet part out loud. Yeah. Because that's exactly what she did, you know. Um, you know, she also, you know, another metaphor I've, I use, I think, in the book, although I like yours better in a way, is, um, you know, peering behind, getting to really actually see behind the beautiful mask of mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. and that, that, that it wears out in public and really see what goes on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, behind that stunningly glamorous right yeah. there's that word again mm -hmm. uh lifestyle that those yeah. people had yeah so for those who are listening or watching and who are completely confused as to who the heck eleanor glenn is i'm going to ask you to do the very hard thing can you mm -hmm. summarize her lifestyle her life not her lifestyle her life um as briefly as possible just kind of give an introduction to who eleanor nell was sure um, so Eleanor Glynn was born in 1864, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of the height of the Victorian era, mm -hmm. uh, on a little island perched off the coast of Normandy called Jersey. That was that mm -hmm. was a British island, and she mostly ends up being raised there. And she has a very conventional sort of middle class upbringing in most ways, um, except that it's more isolated than even some girls. And um, like most girls, she has very little formal education. But she is allowed to read at will in her stepfather's library, which she does. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other sort of important aspect to her childhood to know about is that she has an older sister who's just a year older than her, Lucy, 
who will grow up to be one of the most significant um, couturiers of the entire late Victorian Edwardian period, and certainly mm -hmm. the most notable female one, before mm -hmm. Coco Chanel, mm -hmm. right? Lucille is her is the couturier name she uses. And so, you know, it's for Eleanor, it's a childhood kind of of isolation in books and her sister's sort of um, influence in dressing her little sister, you know, in clothes that from a very young age make her kind of stand out in this society. Um, and so her real one aim in life is to marry and to mm -hmm. marry well. She doesn't have a dowry, which was a huge problem in terms of marrying well at that era. But... She ma manages to do this, and this is really where the book begins, where the conventional marriage plot ended, right, with her securing, mm -hmm. you know, the right catch, this um, English squire, you know, who has a manor house in Essex, which is the wealthiest county in mm -hmm. England, and, you know, travels in a lavish style, and, you know, marries her, even though she has no diary at 28, which is getting towards spinsterhood at that time. This is 1892. Um, <laughs> And so that's sort of where I begin really most of the story. And so again, in it sort of being a modern tale, it's about what happens after you get married, where yeah. most romances, you know, ended. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, from there, she has, a, again, a somewhat conventional beginning, you know, to a marriage produces two children, two girls very quickly, but quickly finds herself very depressed because mm -hmm. the marriage is a misalliance. And that's when she turns to writing. In 1900, she publishes her first book and it becomes a kind of surprise bestseller in England and throughout Britain um, because what she does is she writes with a very light touch about the kind of mores, sexual and otherwise, of this upper class aristocratic British society into mm -hmm. which she's married. Um, and she sort of continues to publish that way in a few more books. And then she publishes in 1907 a book called Three Weeks, which we were talking about, which gets, gets her kicked out of that society. Yeah. Um, but it also turns her into an internationally recognized name and makes her rich. Um, and that's helpful because it, it's at that sort of same moment that she realizes that her husband is, is, is essentially fully broke. Yeah. <clears throat> and so she has to really take over, uh, funding, you know, their fairly lavish lifestyle and, you know, supporting her two daughters and her mother. Um, and so she does, she embraces this role as a kind of now notorious, slightly scandalous author. Um, and that leads her, believe it or not, into the trenches of World War One, and then eventually, you know, to Los Angeles in 1920. Um, she's invited by, you know, Paramount Pictures. She's one of several so-called eminent authors that they mm -hmm. invite. Um, at this moment when Los Angeles has just exploded as the new motion picture capital of the world, right? And so she goes and she's really the only one of them that succeeds and she's there throughout the whole 1920s. She invents the idea of the Et Girl, um, you know, which is a film based on her idea starring the sort of definitive sex symbol of the 1920s, Clara Bow. Yeah, and then um, sort of makes her exit not long after that movie uh and that's sort of where i i mostly end it yeah so that's because that's the end of her big professional influence yeah that was something that really stuck out to me was how after a certain point she almost kind of falls off the radar a little mm -hmm. bit do you have any insight as to why we today don't recognize for someone who is so influential why we don't recognize her as much as we should well, I think, <clears throat> frankly, until very recently, you know, that's why I call the chapter, you know, about three weeks, which also kind of gives a bit of a history of the so-called romance genre, mm -hmm. um, trash, right? I call that yeah. chapter trash. Yeah. And the Atlantic article that you mentioned also, you know, really keyed in on that part of my book. Mm -hmm. The reason we don't know about these women is because until very recently, you know, no one taught about these books and, you know, certainly English classes or literature classes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they weren't even sort of part of the reclaimed um, canon, you mm -hmm. know, that started feminists started to, you know, recreate in the 70s forward, right? Um, they were just kind of these, you know, books that we knew were the best selling genre of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And yet they received, they were basically invisible. Mm 
um, you know, in, in the larger culture. And I think partially the internet has changed that. Several things have changed that. And, and, it, and it's still a work in progress, right? I mean, there still is a lot of, I had more than one person when I told them that I was working on this project who was of a certain age, say older than me, because that some people that age do know her name. Um, and they would be like, why are you writing a book about her? So, oh, wow. you know, that kind of snobbery still exists, I guess. Is yeah. What I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Now you're talking to a librarian who specializes in romance novels. So I right. fully understand that sentiment towards not only just romance, but that sentiment of, um, again, towards things that represent feminine desire. And I think personally that Eleanor Glynn really revolutionized the way that it was depicted and so i'm not surprised at all that she was kind of shunted to the side mm -hmm. um in favor of these younger more glamorous movie stars who embodied everything that she had been walking and talking for what 50 years at that point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because something you said earlier when you were talking about how she she taught Gloria Swanson how to handle the press. I keep thinking about the, um, there's this one instance that you wrote about where she had the Pilgrim, was it the Pilgrim Mothers? Yeah, the Pilgrim Mothers. The Pilgrim Mothers. <laughs> and they invited her to dinner. And then when she got there, they refused to let her sit at the table with them because of what she wrote. And then afterwards, she just had this like newspaper bicker back and forth with them. And mm -hmm. all I could think about was that when you were talking about Gloria Swanson, and I was like, today, that would be like a Twitter feud. Right, there. right, right. No, it exactly. It was a Twitter feud. Yeah. Um, of that era. Um, yeah, that is a really, really, f I, I found that story really funny too. And I love the part where when she's leaving and the press is interviewing her about it still, right? Um, she says, you know, the press, you know, I love because, you know, she made friends with all the reporters. This was partially right why she did so well in America. She said, you know, the press, you know, they got the spirit of my words right, but they got the actual quote a little wrong. I would never would have compared the Pilgrim Mothers to tabby cats. They're twittering sparrows. Oh, twittering. <laughs> hey, there you go. There we go, Perfect. Twitter. <laughs> I love right? it. But, I you know, it. she was such a cat lady that there was no way that she was going to have those uh, Pilgrim Mothers compared no. to cats. No. I loved all of the photos that you managed to pull up of her in your book that were of her with her cats. And I was like, she's just great. I love her. So many more, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is your favorite fact about Nell out of all the hmm. facts? Hmm. I mean, that's a hard question. I know. It's a good question, but it's a really hard question. I'll pick, I'll, I think I'll pick one of my favorite facts that's also a way to limit it in my mind anyway, is one of the things that I learned that most moved and surprised me, mm -hmm. um, which involved really realizing how um, the experience of reporting on World War One while living in Paris really changed her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this was, of course, also following the death of her husband, you know, who, however miserably married they were, they stayed married until his death. And then following the end of her really only true love and love mm -hmm. affair. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, to be in Paris for almost two years while it's being bombed and reporting on that and going to the trenches like it was it was clear to me writing that part of the book um how much that changed her and many women of that era and mm -hmm. that's something that i think you know in the women's history a little bit right suffrage comes to women in all these countries right after world war one and part of why you know we learn is because they prove themselves during world war one um, the thing that I think even more, though, amazed me was that she was able to, like, recognize how happy it made her taking that active role in society that in a way was sort of not as gendered as her mm -hmm. other roles, right, mm -hmm. for the first time in her life, and recognize that if she lost that, that she would probably become depressed again, like a lot of women were, yeah. right? 
And so she takes this opportunity to go to Los Angeles, you know, where she is, like I mentioned, the oldest person. And it was also that fact, mm -hmm. like, you know, I remember like writing out the birth dates of like all these actors and producers and writers and, you know, because I was like, I think she was older than everybody. And then when I was, you know, really did the math, seeing just how much older she was, mm -hmm. um, that was like a fun fact. Like, you know, yeah. when does that ever happen? When does like a woman, she's like 56 when she arrives and she becomes like the major grand dame influencer <laughs> of the entire scene. Yes. Yeah, it was when we sat down on the podcast and we were looking at, you know, she was born in 1864 and she died 1943, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we were looking at, okay, let's put it in global context because that's something I always love to do. 1864 was the Civil War in mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. 1943 was World War II. Mm -hmm. To think about what she lived through, everything mm -hmm. that she lived through in that time period alone it was just it's mind-blowing to think of it mm -hmm. that way mm -hmm. and and yeah. she managed to be you know you know she's in cairo and you know she's in all the hot spots of the british empire at the height at the kind of apogee of its influence right and then right as it's fading she shifts her attention really to america and she ends up being you know you know witness to the birth of this new industry as i mentioned she's witness to world war one firsthand the signing of the treaty of versailles yeah. she's sitting there you know like with prime ministers and you know newspaper barons and and you know discussing you know the peace I mean, she's like Waldo. She just always shows yeah. up in the most interesting places. Yeah. I, oh, I can't remember. There's a movie that's out there that it's like this person who's living throughout time and you see him pop up in all these photos, like historical events. And he's like a big influence on the historical events that happen. That's kind of how I envision her. Almost. Right. She's, she's there. She's an observer and she's literally reporting on, like you said, everything that she's seeing with the treaty and world war one and she's reporting in a way in these novels of her class and the people around her oh, even yeah. if it is fiction she's still reporting on them mm -hmm. and 100%. then it turns into hollywood which is a whole different kind of reporting because right. film is technically it's supposed to be like a mirror right but i really think that she took real life and she brought that into the mirror of film if that makes sense well, yes, she brought certainly um, knowledge since, you know, when she arrived, um, there was still the first of all, British culture, right? There was a lot more Anglophilia mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there was a lot more interest, you know, like now we have Downton Abbey, we have the crown. It, we still show it. Obviously, yeah. we have the Harry and Meghan <laughs> obsession. Fair. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um so it's not like it goes away but right. it but where earlier maybe a century ago was fairly dominant it becomes now a very prominent minority slice of the popular culture sort of landscape mm -hmm. um but when she arrives there um she so she what she offers is is reality in terms of knowing these aristocratic settings knowing what people really dress like when they go to dinner parties and fancy places knowing what chateaus look like knowing what country houses look like all these settings that they're starting mm -hmm. to depict right but they most of these folks are from these really modest backgrounds yeah so they don't know what they really look like you and know I'm, she does yeah. an american pre-depression backgrounds as well where it's right. completely divested from everything she was brought up in um she also brought a lot of i think what we would call stereotypical depictions of romance now mm -hmm. but back mm -hmm. then that were also revolutionary can you sum up some of the ones that she did kind of bring life sure um yeah i wrote a little piece about this for slate you know certainly so much of just starting with the visual iconography since we've been talking about hollywood you know the idea that a woman in a long slinky velvet gown wearing a long strand of pearls and possibly with a rose clutched between her teeth sitting beside a ro roaring fire mm -hmm. right um that that is a setting for romance and a setting that signals a woman that has a certain kind of sexual self-possession right uh, it's a much more direct um, visualization of mm -hmm. female sexuality and female desire than would have been, you know, commonplace before. 
Mm -hmm. um, the idea of the negligee. So her, her sister, as I mentioned, the designer Lucille, you know, invents the negligee. Yeah. And so, you know, and Eleanor, of course, wants, you know, actresses to really, if there's going to be a romance scene, dress in real, you know, in the real kinds of clothes that signal uh, sexual desire again. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, you know, she, she sketches all this out, of course, first in her books. And so Hollywood is really the visualization of it in a more, you know, purely yeah. visual form. But in her books, you know, it's also containing elements like we've discussed where sexual chemistry is frankly acknowledged. Female sexual desire is frankly acknowledged, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and in ways, right, you know, rose petals on the bed and, you know, writhing on the velvet um, divans, you know, so the you tiger couldn't... skin and the tiger and writhing, you yes. know, undulating one of her favorite verbs yes. on the tiger skin, right, which is the very, the most famous scene in three weeks, of course. Yep. Um, and also this idea of the bodice ripper, right? Yeah. You, you know, in three weeks, the heroine is more the aggressor. You know, in many of her books, the male is more the aggressor, but mm -hmm. definitely this playing with kind of force and animal desire and, um, you know, in ways that some ways that we would consider retrogressive today, right? But the idea at the time really was that someone had to almost, you know, tap into this animal, you know, idea of animal desires to kind of resurrect the idea of female sexuality at all. That's that's a very interesting point. I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, I was thinking while you were speaking of kind of publishing history and how romance as a genre has evolved. I mean, we could go back to Jane Austen if we want kind of like that stereotypical early romance where it was just love, romantic love between two people, a man and a woman at the time, and their verbal expression of the love and longing glances and the evolution that it takes to get to three weeks. If we look at that as like the, the peak start of this new modern novel that really kind of, I think, I would say 1974 with Flame in the Flower, Kathleen Woodowis mm -hmm. would kind of right. the next like big iteration of that. Um, and just kind of how Eleanor took these things that were no doubt written about. Um, what was, there was a book written in the 18, 1700s, and of course now I can't remember it, but it was a Victorian sex novel basically written by a man about a prostitute um mm -hmm. in georgia and england mm -hmm. i can't remember is it title. pamela pamela or... thank you yeah yes that one and that was like the best-selling sex novel right right and, right and then there's no doubt other books like that but they were indie published before indie publishing was a thing really and kind of like underground and the Jane austen stayed above ground right but then eleanor comes along and she brings that underground again she takes the quiet part and says it out loud she takes the underground and brings it up into the light and then she takes it into Hollywood where it just, I think it spawns a whole new like generation of film at just the perfect time because right. this is when silent goes into talking film. Right. Right. I mean, although I, I, I still have to say a word, you know, I mean, it, it was perfect for silent films first too, mm -hmm. though, because, um, there was a certain the visual style of it, you know, mm -hmm. communicated so much too, right? Motive. And so yeah. yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I just I have a fondness obviously for silent films. Yeah. Yeah. Um but you know, there was a way that by the time sound came to because of the depression, that hastened um, for a time anyway, the shift away from stories about the upper class in the same way that, you know, that had been common in the 20s. In the 20s, right, it's the roaring 20s, there's all this new consumer wealth, Model Ts and, you know, mass produced, the, you know, cars and everything, radio, yeah. um, you know, all these new technologies. And it was a very decadent time. I mean, yeah. Babylon, the film really captures that, right? Yeah, very decadent time uh, in many ways. And the 30s aren't like that. No. So, you know, Eleanor could do aust austerity, but her style was very much not associated with that. No, no, that's that's another good point. I hadn't, again, thought of it like that. Um, the fact that 
she was this glamour and she was this glamour model and influencer I guess you could say before influencers yeah. were really a thing that when the depression hit that was kind of the antithesis of what she was mm-hmm. so she didn't really have much of a foot even though she was still influential in her way but mm-hmm. the 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 media shifted even that's right right yeah. the media shifted and and the whole cultural sensibility shifted to something yeah. that was much more working class hard boiled do you think um her glamour is really what helped her make the jump from author to like movie influ- i'm going to keep using the word influencer even though yeah, I know. yeah i can't yeah, think of another translate. word it translates yeah. to today um you're not the first don't feel bad <laughs> um i don't mind it you know so I do is the short answer. Um, I also think that as many people said, she had a real talent for friendship. And so I think that really helped her, Hmm. um, you know, sort of find her footing in this really very foreign milieu, you Mm -hmm. know? Uh, but I do think that it was her style and the kind of, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with British accents. I lived in uh, England for a little while, so yeah. Okay, right. And so, you know, there is a, a sort of, you know, thing yes. that you get when you have an upper class British accent. Yes. Yeah. And then if you are also dressed impeccably, yeah. right? And the most, you know, hook coach, she traveled always with a dress, her personal dressmaker, right? Yes. And everyone in Hollywood knew that Lucille was her sister, knew who Lucille was. Everyone had been dressed from her by her before the war, right? So she carried all of this sort of cultural um, legitimacy, you know, in, in a way that doesn't like you know, we, you know, how we were talking about romance novels being trash. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not yet really, she's not a romance novel in a way that's fully novelist in a way that's fully kind of got her categorized that Mm -hmm. way yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think in person, her sort of uh, cultural sophistication and glamour really just, that's what everybody says. It just, it awed them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, accounts for her influence too. She called herself an authoress, I think you said at one point, and just the the vision of her going authoress came to me as soon as I read that, and I could see who she was and just kind of this glamorous figure, and again, glamour, um, and the fact that when she was brought to Hollywood, she negotiated for her own Pullman drawing car with right. a personal maid and her dresser. I was like, I want to be this woman when I grow up. Yes, yes. She is in many ways a model to us all. Yeah. Several other people have really loved the fact that she had her own little um, annex built on, you know, her room of her own before Virginia Woolf made that, you yep. know, that famous little set of essays yeah. uh, that made the famous famous, you know, she yep. she was a big believer in that. Yeah. So. I will admit that I know not much about the golden age of Hollywood besides that. I love the aesthetic and the films that came out of it. And I know some of the names when they come out. Um, And I don't really know how to phrase this into a question, but can you talk a little bit of how the golden age of Hollywood might have influenced Eleanor in turn? Do you think it influenced her as much as she did that? It I mean, I think it did make her stories more plot driven Mm -hmm. um, because she did come to recognize that things for things to work well on film, there needed to be more external action Mm -hmm. um, than in a novel. Mm -hmm. And I think she struggled with that, but I do think Hollywood one of the reasons she succeeded there where most other writers didn't was that she did sort of adjust her mode of storytelling to some extent to suit the to try to suit the screen mm-hmm. um she also like i said you know she was for the most part pretty collaborative in her working style there you mm-hmm. know and so that's also necessary right um yeah. if you're going to succeed there because it is a very collaborative art mm-hmm. um and 
but I think that that influenced her in a way too, because she, while she had had a kind of, you know, certainly in the British aristocratic set that she sort of married into, right? She did a lot of socializing. She was a socialite and very successful at it. I think Hollywood was the first like working community where she also had, yeah. you know, right? Cause she was never a part of a literary community. Right. This was the first creative working community that she was a part of. And so right. I think it sort of, it brought out a new side to her professional life. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just thinking of that. Yeah, that that's interesting. I hadn't really thought of Hollywood as like a working community before, I guess, because of <laughs> course now with our modern view of it, but it's still it's an industry and yeah, it's a very collaborative industry at that. Mm -hmm. yeah, um so kind of looking out for more like big picture things, I have two kind of bigger questions I would like to ask. First, we've already talked about the time period that Nell lived in was this big span that had a lot of stuff going on. How do you think the view of femininity changed during that time period overall from 1864 to 1943? Well, I mean, so we're talking about, yeah, I know the hard thing about women too, is that there's so many different kinds, exactly. right? Exactly. And different and cultures. So, yeah. And, and so it can be very, very, very hard to generalize. That's a good um, point. I mean, if we're talking about white middle class to upper class women like Nell, mm. um, you know, there is a lot of change, you know, um, there is, you know, the shift away from the complete acceptance, you know, an idealization of the idea of separate spheres. Mm -hmm. where men are supposed to be out in the world working and women are supposed to be at home tending the domestic realm. Um, that is pretty much the only conventional, you know, acceptable path for a middle upper class white woman. When Nell is born, by the time she dies, it is mm -hmm. still the major one, mm -hmm. but it is no longer the only one. And that's right. because, you know, the number of women um who are at least for some part of their life working for wages grows dramatically as i said suffrage is passed you know for white women in you know not just in the united states but first in britain right everywhere but france actually yeah every country in the in western europe that fought in world war one passed women's suffrage after the war right and so women yeah. do start to get formally incorporated which is a big deal, um, you know, into the public sphere, you mm -hmm. know, as as actors, as voters, as jury members. None of that existed when when right. she was born. Right. Um, so, you know, things really change a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's still, you know, by the time she dies, none of us would recognize as women the options available to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right? They were still really different than they yeah. are now. Yeah. But but yet they were very different than what they had been when she was born 80 years before. Yeah. It's true. So then I mean, wait, one other thing. I mean, there's yeah. just an idea given our topic, right? Yeah. I mean, the 19 teens is also not just the period in which, you know, the suffrage movements will finally really gain traction. It's also the birth of modern feminism mm -hmm. and modern feminism, you know, was specifically concerned with this idea of what was called at the time sex rights, right? Yeah. What, what were women's sex rights compared to men, you know, and this idea right. of birth control, this is the birth of the birth control movement and Margaret Sanger's clinics open in the 19 teens. Yeah. So, you know, none of that was around when Nell was born again. Um, but by the time she dies, you know, that's that's at least it's part of the debate. You can get the information. Yeah. And it's interesting, too. Do you think her I mean, this is like a very big question, I guess. But um, do you think her novels and her work had any influence on the feminism movement, especially the sex movement of the teens? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when you have people like Emma Goldman, who was a radical anarchist, sex yeah. radical, and every other kind yeah. of radical, labor <laughs> radical, 
calling the book, you know, uh, magnificent, a declaration of independence when you have, yes, it was so many people speak to the fact that it, you know, to quote someone else, Cecil Beaton, you know, it tore down the remaining, you know, veil of Victorian hypocrisy mm. about this idea that women, first of all, like we said, that that people did cheat on their spouses, yeah. right? You know, that um, women did have sexual desire, you know, I mean, these subjects that everyone knew kind of, right? But no one admitted in public culture. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. We look at that a lot on the podcast too, of kind of these books in our time, in our teens, our 20 teens that have kind of influenced uh, a lot of what's going on today. Mm -hmm. Um, And Hate It or Love It, Fifty Shades of Grey did have a lot of the same impact. I think that Three Weeks had Mm -hmm. um, Uh where with 50 shades of gray it was with ebook publishing and kind of how ebook publishing spawned this whole movement of new romance trends new romance genres that have come out so like monster romance in the past couple of years you would have probably seen maybe one or two romance books that had monsters as the heroes in right. 2005 but as soon as 50 shades came out we had that ebook publishing start rolling around and now monster romance is trending as like one of the top published publishing spheres of indie books right now is that right? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Um, so if if you want to dive into it, there are a couple authors. There's Ruby Dixon, who writes Aliens, and it's mm-hmm. D-I-X-O-N. Um, and then I would say Katie Robert, and it's K-A-T-E-E, and then Robert Singular. Um, right. Katie Robert writes a little bit of everything, but she started going into the monster sphere. So it's it's just interesting to look at how everything is so slick, cyclical with... Mm-hmm. What happened with Nell's time and then what's happening in our time as well. Yeah, well, I definitely, for a long time when I tried to explain who she was, I would say she wrote the kind of Fifty Shades of Grey of her day. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. And that's what made her famous. And then she ended up in Hollywood and sort of scripted the early sex scenes that still influence how we think a sex scene should look. Right. And sometimes in a cliched way, but nonetheless. Yeah. But (laughs) it was still... Yeah, it's, it's still, still like put on a negligee, grab some rose yep. petals, yep. right? Light a Get candle. the fire going. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's still the same darn thing. Per, per, you know, silk pillows <laughs> and right. Good smelling things, all those things. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, so you had mentioned when I asked about changes of womanhood, you had mentioned marginalized communities. Did Nell have any interaction with marginalized communities? We'll narrow it down in Hollywood. Right. I mean, I looked, I wanted to find more connections to, um, you know, essentially people of color, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was very hard. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously in the British world that she traveled in, no. Yeah. Um, not at all. And then when she comes to the United States and the first, you know, two thirds of the book is really about that British world. The last third, I mean, for the time, you know, as she's constantly, as you know, you know, I deal with anti-Semitism in the book and Italians, right? The so-called new immigrants, the Jews and Italians that came over, you know, in in very large waves starting in the Mm -hmm. 1880s that Mm -hmm. created massive really we could call it hysteria yeah. among the so-called, you know, Native American wasps, yeah. um, you know. So I deal with, you know, marginalized groups in that way because mm-hmm. certainly it's hard to remember this now, but the folks that founded Hollywood, of course, you know, they were not, they were marginalized folks yeah. for the most part, they right? Were. They were immigrant, <laughs> working class people, usually from very poor backgrounds most of them got started in theater you know and then this new industry absorbed all this theatrical talent and whoa this new art was born and they all became incredibly famous and rich yeah but they were not they were you know they started off with very somewhat marginalized you know backgrounds most of them yeah um and so you know that to that extent now you know, I couldn't really find any connection between her and Anime Wong, who was a character I really wanted to write yeah. more about, um, you know, or any of the Asian actors that were prominent in the silent era. I know she was a 
big, big dancer, you know, which of course I write about. So I'm sure there were black jazz musicians performing oh, yeah. in these clubs, but that wasn't noted in anything I was reading. And, you know, I didn't, I mean, I sort of nodded to it, but I didn't, yeah. you know, there was no reason to go into too much detail. Right. Um, because it was yeah. always a problem with her. The settings and the people she knew were always so interesting. Keeping it, you know, keeping this narrative story yeah. going was sometimes challenging. Yeah. But, so I don't know if, I mean, that's kind of a vague answer, I guess, that the, you know, that's, I guess, the answer I have. Yeah. Plus, I mean, historians and anybody who's dealt with primary sources will know that primary source erasure of people of color and marginalized communities is a real thing. It is. And, 100%. I mean, obviously we're still dealing with that today but to the you know to the extent yeah, that it was i mean i was also because i know the number of queer people what we would call queer people now yeah. were, you know so prevalent in that yeah. in that period too and you know she made a couple of references negative you mm -hmm. know uh but but in paris i never found her say I never found her to mention anything about homosexuals in, in Los Angeles. And I was huh. just like, huh. And so, you know, I mean, it's hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We can only hope that someday somebody will find a giant box full of all these primary sources that we've never had before and that have all these voices that we want to hear from. But it's true. Until somebody unlocks their grandma's attic, we will never know. Yes. Could happen um, though. Yes. New thing, you know, new things are found all the time, yeah. Yeah. especially once people are looking for them. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, so one final big question that I have for you is Hollywood at this time in the 1920s going into the Depression era really saw a huge shift. How do you think that shift in Hollywood with the popularization, the glamorization reflected America and Americans? even beyond just the the opulence that we talked about earlier. Do you think? Well, I can't, I'm, I'm not sure I fully okay, understand okay, the question. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, what do you think that this popularization, this dramatic, like, I almost want to use the word fetishization, but it's not quite like a fetishization. It's like admir admiring them. What do you think that had to say of Americans as a whole? The admiring of the British aristocratic culture of or Hollywood. What? Oh, oh yeah. okay. Sorry, shift um, turn signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, I mean, I think that part of again, uh, this I you know this shows up in Babylon, and I and I do give Damien Chazelle credit for doing a lot of research for that mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think that it is the most historically accurate portrait of that period that has yet to be put on the screen. Okay. Um, and I said that I wrote a piece, you can see uh, fact and fiction in Babylon and Slate. Okay. And I said that in the review. Um, I mean, I think that it spoke to so many, if we recall in the 1920s, even though Americans seem to be getting rich, World War One has decimated Europe, but left America rich, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and untouched by any of that destruction. And it sort of primed the economic engine, right, of the United States. And it explodes in the 1920s. But in actuality, most people are not rich. Two thirds of Americans are still living below the poverty line. Yeah. They're buying things on credit mm -hmm. that they're gonna lose when the depression hits, mm -hmm. right? And there's no safety net. There's no worker protections almost still mm -hmm. when the depression hits, right? And so people are still living paycheck to paycheck and they're financing um, a lot of the new buying, right? Like I said, on credit. And so the movies, it was like people, knew, if you read the fan magazines at the time, you know, one of the things that's very clear is that these stars are not at all, most of them, shy about where they come from. Mm -hmm. And so for the average working class American anyway, you know, these news, you know, it really does seem realistic that yeah. they might move to Los Angeles and become the next Clara Bow, yep. right? Yep. Who was literally plucked at 16 from a fame and fortune con uh, contest from like the tenement slums of Brooklyn, 
Yep. So I think it did represent this um, engine of social mobility. I think it represented access to this glamorous, beautiful world that most people really couldn't afford at all. Mm -hmm. And so it became both an escape, but also an inspiration mm. um, for what might be possible, you know? And I think that's what's sort of beautiful about it. Yeah. It was this visualization of the American dream. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. But instead of the white picket fence, it was the the yeah, money this, and the glitz and the sparkle. Decadent, yeah, it really was. A kind of decadence, really, we got to say, right? Yeah, but yeah, money, glamour, sparkle, too. I mean, Eleanor wasn't into decadence, you know, as you know, if you read my book. She was in terms of luxury, like decadent right. luxury. But she was not doing drugs or, no. you know, getting wasted in Los Angeles. And no. she tried to sort of tamp down on that. Mm. Um, but she also wasn't a moralizer. So she was happy with her cats living her yes. life. <laughs> yes, yeah. she was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that draws an end to all the questions that I had. Thank, thank you, you, Jackie. Yeah. This is great. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Well, take right. care. You as well. Thank you.